with a, a thought. This is from Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. Uh, he said this, he was at, uh, this was a commencement address at Princeton. He said, tomorrow, in a very real sense, your life, the life that you author from scratch on your own begins. How will you use your gifts? What choices will you make? Will inertia be your guide or will you follow your passions? Will you follow dogma or will you be original? Will you choose a life of ease or a life of service and adventure? I love that, service and adventure. Will you wilt under criticism or will you follow your con convictions? Will you bluff it out when you're wrong or will you apologize? Will you guard your heart against re rejection or will you act when you fall in love? Will you play it safe or will you be a little bit swashbuckling when it's tough? Will you give up or will you be relentless? Will you be a cynic or be, will you be a builder? Will you be clever at the expense of others or will you be kind? I will hazard a prediction. When you are 80 years old and in a quiet moment of reflection, narrating for only yourself the most personal version of your life story, the telling that will be most compact and meaningful will be the series of choices you have made. In the end, we are our choices. Build yourself a great story. I like that thought, that we're creators, um, creators in all the things that we do. Um, I don't know how many people were able to go see the devotional with uh, Jean B. Bingham on Tuesday, but she, I, I loved what she said. What were her five things? Understand your divine destiny. What did we talk about? The importance of doctrines and principles. Two, trust and confidence in the Savior and his atonement. Three, Make a plan for your life and connect to heaven. Hopefully that's what we've done. Four, prioritize your plan and do the most important things first. And number five, ask in faith as you step forward. Discipleship is not doing things perfectly, but doing things intentionally. And I like those thoughts because it's really uh, consistent with what we are. Okay, a couple of things too, final exams. Again, you guys get the option. Um, for those who want to take the final exams, we'll, they're, they're here and we will... Uh, you can kind of pick those up after class. Also, I've got the PFPs graded um, there, and we'll, we'll hand those out after class as well. So some of you, the next 75 minutes is the last that you'll have to see. <laughs> Go ahead, questions? Yes, on the final, is, is it all written by hand? Yep, written by hand. And so is there a time limit on it? There is. Three hours unless you, um, unless you want more time, and then you ask me beforehand, and I'll tell you what you can, uh, I can give you more. Okay. So it's an option, and, and again, it won't hurt you. If the average of your quiz score is minus 6% is less than you get on the final exam, you'll get the average of that. Uh, again, options, it's an option. It won't hurt you to take the exam. Yeah, I'm just three hours, three Most people are like two to okay. two, one and a half to two hours. Um, so realize it, it is comprehensive. So, and what I tried to do is I tried to say, what are those things that are most likely to come across in the next you know, 10 to 20 years? So you can kind of tell, you know, something on houses, something on, you know, giving, retirement planning, things like that, budgeting, things like that. I'll have a help section on Friday. I'll send you a note for anyone, for the two people who want to come and attend. Okay, <laughs> other questions? So um, at, after cl class today, you'll have your PFPs. They'll be all handed back, and then we'll be done. Yes? Pardon me? Um, actually, it's due um, Thursday, December 19th at 2 p.m. It's due when, when our final is. So, um, so you have roughly uh, a week, week to do that. Yes. Is it open? What do you want it to be, George? Uh, open, open book, open notes. Open book, open notes. Again, I try to do I, again high learning and low stress. So I, s I find open book and open notes it tends to work out better. So, Tyler. So what's it gonna be like once you get out and I'm no longer your teacher? You're gonna have access to all of this stuff. Hopefully my stuff will be still be on the website and you'll still have access to that there too. If not, you know, yeah, but, but hopefully it will. So the, the point here is you, you're gonna have access to all of this stuff. Um, here's a question. <coughs> Does it make sense? Let me just share a, an, an email. It says, Brother Sudwicks, I took your personal fi finance class and I loved it. 
Uh, this is an older student. I worked hard on my personal goals and financial goals notebook that you assigned us. And I've used those principles and, and accomplished many of the goals I set during the last 13 years. I still have the binder that I turned in during that class. My husband and I and even paid off our home as a result of the principles you taught. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the lessons you taught and how you gave me the keys I needed to be free from the worry that can come from mismanagement of money. And again, the, the keys needed to be free from the mismanagement of money. And so what I thought today what we'd do, assuming I can find the remote, it's kind of like home, can't find the remote. Oh, okay. So what I'd like to do is just start, let's, let's take a look back at the class. What are the things we, we talked about in Friends here? So we said we shared how we bring Christ into our finances. Remember those things? We talked about that. And basically our learning framework is consistent with those things. We seek to understand, learn, and love the Savior and his atonement more. And we come to understand that personal finance is just part of uh, God's plan for his children. Strive to change daily. Learn to apply his word and create our lives. We always remember him. Again, increase our faith in. We learned that personal finance is simply part of his plan for his children. It's just one of those things to help us to become like that. As Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, it's part of his customized curriculum to help us to return with him. It's just part of his plan. Number two, we talked about strive daily and become a more converted disciple. You know what? Um, realize that discipleship is not doing things uh, perfectly, but as Elder uh, Uchtdorf said, it's, it's doing things intentionally. So we strive to change daily and become a more converted disciple, and we learn how do you change daily. We talked about that. Doctrines and principles confirmed by the Spirit change behavior. Third thing we talked about, apply his words and create our lives and values more closely with him. And we talked about, you know, how application is just an invitation to create. You know, and we're all creators. Creation is a spiritual gift. And I, I think it's fun, too. When I read the scripture, I go, yeah. I think it's logical that we, were, we had our first lessons in creation in the pre-existence, where I think we all actually helped create the world. And then the last one, I've been spending more time on this one. We always remember him. And I, I've been thinking over the last semester, what do we remember when he says we should always remember him in the sacraments? And here's just some ideas here. We remember that it's death and it's atonement shaped us. Remember this story, I can't remember who the general authority, about those two kids. They were off and they were hiking and they were way beyond where they should have been. And they got into a, a point that was very precarious and one was able to have put the other on his shoulders and was able to send the first one to safety but there was no way that the second one could do that. And so we told uh, the first son, go get a, go to a branch and you can help me. And, uh, but the, the, the brother knew what he was trying to do. And so he just waited there. And, and then the brother on the ledge, he said, you know, I, I got a choice. I can jump. If I make it, I'm fine. If I'm not, I'm dead. But he jumped and he missed. But his brother above grabbed his hand and was able to pull him to safety. How do you thank someone who saved your life? You know, all things, including ourselves, are his. There's nothing we have is ours. You know, we can't have pride in something that's not our own. And I think if we remember that all of these things are his, then we will make much better choices with his resources. We're a steward. We're, we're <laughs> we work for Christ. And our job is to use these resources in a way to best for our families and those around us. And even, if, again, we are his unprofitable servants. Even if we did everything perfectly, even if we could do exactly, we're still unprofitable servants. So there should be no prominence, no pride. And we should also be, we should be humble and teachable. And then we emphasize that we need to be diligent as our conduct on the journey is important as our destination. So that's the thing we need to remember. It's daily conduct as we work back. Okay, so... That was kind of the key that we started with. And the second thing we did is we talked about what's our learning framework. Our learning framework is a little bit different. Uh, personal finance is just part of his plan. 
But our framework was Inuit. It was doctrines, principles, and applications. And, and this was the process by Elder Bednar. Nathan, can I get you to read that just somehow? So what we tried to do is we tried to teach it in a way that we will have that, produce that spiritual power, uh, protection and direction that we need. Talked about those doctrines, principles, and application. Why is this framework important? Really, it's a simple framework. It asks three questions. Doctrines, principles, and application. Why should we, and what we did in this class is we add, learn and become better at personal finance. What are the principles on which how we blank Learn and become better at personal finance are based, and how do we learn and become better? Again, doctrines, principles, applications, what's wise and how? And it makes such an important difference. And we can use this not only in personal finance, you can do, use it in asset management, you can use it in accounting, you can use it in any area of our lives. But we just happen to apply it here in personal finance. We taught doctrines and principles confirmed by the spirit change behavior. And then what we did is in each area is we, we developed what are the doctrines and principles. You know, if the apostle says the answers are there, we should do that. And hopefully you realize what we've tried to do is we've tried to say in each of the 16 areas we talked about, what are? What are the guiding principles? What are the guiding doctrines? And so we came up with, it's, that, that seemed to be prevalent throughout the class, we came up with really Five key doctrines. So identity. What's the impact of identity on what we've learned over the last semester? Isaac, what's the impact? Um, I mean, I think it's kind of like knowing the why. Like yeah. you said, that's it. Um, it's kind of like what, like who we really are as you know, people. And all of these, we talk about how we're sons of God. And Someone said, don't teach me what to do. Teach me who I am. Once I know who you know I am, I'll know what to do. And who are we? Children of God. And we're known individually. You know, as I read through the scriptures, the Lord talks to Moses and to Joseph and he did, and he calls them by name. It's important to realize that he knows us. He knows our children. When things were tough with my kids, it's hard to realize that Heavenly Father knows my children better than I do because they were his children long before they were mine. How about obedience? What's the critical part about obedience? Why is the doctrine of obedience so important? Nathan. We can make these visions goals, but we, we can't stick to it. Um, other things that I think are important is the importance of the spirit. As we obey the commandments, we can have the spirit with us. And the spirit can have such important points. I'm reading this book. We, we're about halfway through it. It's called The Seven Miracles That, uh, that Shaped America. And it was just interesting things how little the Lord brought little things. Uh, and uh, I, I think it was President Hinckley that said our lives um, move on very short hinges. You know, a little short movement here can have a big impact there. And obedience allows the spirit to come into our lives. Um, and as we have the spirit, we can make such, such, we can make much better decisions. Number three, what did we learn about stewardship? Michael, what have you learned about stewardship over the semester? And we should pay attention to it. And we, all have it. and we all have it. Will we act differently if we're a steward over something instead of being an owner over something? Yeah, it does. We're 
commanded to make use of the means the Lord has provided. And just as just as the Lord, when he created the world, he took the available resources there, the materials and things. Likewise, when we create, we do the same. And we're going to learn about agency. And what have we, what have we emphasized about agency in the class? We should make the best decisions about what's in our power to control. Um, I like, you know, uh, agency is one of the greatest gifts God has given us. And do we appreciate that? In fact, if there was a war fought in heaven over the principle of agency. And then accountability. We've talked about accountability. Own sins and not Adam's sins. We are accountable for our actions. And I like this thought, too, at the, the last line here. It's not going to be check every box. Did you get a point for each of your actions? That's not what judgment's going to be. Judgment's not going to be, hey, did you do everything you know, perfectly? Judgment is going to be, are we comfortable in Christ's presence? Because did we become like our Savior? And if, we're, if, we're, if we became like him, we will be very comfortable in his presence. And if not, as the scriptures talk about, well, you know, we wish that the rocks could, could fall upon us and hide us from the greatness of our Savior. Um, what were the key principles? What we did on the principle side there too is, is we tried to come up, what are the guiding principles in each of these 16 areas? And it was interesting that in each of these 16 areas, the first three principles were about the same. Understand yourself, your vision goals. Seek, receive the natural and the spirit's guidance. And then understand the key areas of what it was we were talking about. And then we went through 16 different areas. That's, a, that's quite an impressive list. I actually had some, uh, one of the administration people come to me and he says, you know, Brian, you just got too much material in your class. And students were saying it was just a little bit too busy. So I gave him a list of these 16 areas and I says, okay, which would you like me to take out? He smiled and he kind of said, Brian, go back and teach it the way you want. <laughs> but but it's, but it's important. Uh, it's important that we do these things. Um, and then we talked about key areas. Application is just an invitation. Ethan, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. Create our lives. And that's what we want to do. We want to create it more with him. We're all creators. <laughs> we shared the process. In fact, you all created your personal financial plan. You guys, you guys have all done what uh, yeah. Sister Bingham said you should do. You should plan your life, prioritize your goals. And then the next step is you need to walk forward with faith. That he knows who you are and where you are and then you can do that. Um, we talked about vision, the importance of vision. That where there is no vision, the people perish. And, and I like what Elder Callister said, with increased vision comes increased motivation that as we can see who we are, uh, it makes a difference. Talked about goals. What do we want to have? What should we do? Again, what have you done in this class? You follow through what a prophet has said. He says, plan your financial future early, then live your plan. And it makes me feel good that, that, that in this class, I get to help you do that. Um, we talked on plans and strategies. Again, what I had to do in this class, if I'm truly going to save you that million bucks, I had to give you detailed, concrete plans and strategies for each of the 16 different areas, at least to give you ideas. You don't have to use these plans and strategies, but to give you ideas and kind of uh, just to share a few things, and hopefully we've been successful there. And then we talked about constraints. One of the biggest joys about being adults is you have to be able to plan for what's coming. And part of that planning is what can get in the way? What can cause you to not be, you, to lose your perspective? Again, Satan tries to distract us. He distorts the truth. Um, and so what, what do we do to help us to maintain that vision? What are the problems you will likely encounter and how will you solve them so they don't hinder your progress? 
And I know in my life, I've, I've had to put, ma make little commandments for myself to keep me in line. <laughs> I turn my phone off at 9 o'clock at night <laughs> just because too much going on. S certain other things that I do just to help me so I'll make sure I won't, I, I, those constraints won't be a major one. And then accountability. How will you get others to help? And when you're single, it's tough, but mom and dad can help. When you're married, you've got a spouse. When you have kids, kids are probably the biggest accountability. You want to you work on a goal, you tell your kids. I had a goal that I wa wouldn't watch TV except when Ann was there, and so when she was, she would be traveling. <laughs> Remember one time I was just so bored, I just turned it on. One of my kids came in, Dad, is this how you, how you not watch TV? <laughs> so I went, turned it off, and I haven't turned it on since it's there. And you know, I, maybe it's because I'm an addict. I like things like 24 and Emergence and some of these other, some of these other ones here too. Um, but um, it, it's just important that we, we, we work this, uh, through this framework. And then the question is, is this learning framework important? So it's, it's a different learning framework. And um, I think it, it is impo important because what does it do? It does these six things. It helps us ask the right questions. Someone said that you know you shouldn't get a degree for answering the questions. You should get a degree for asking the right ones. And so hopefully what we've done in this class is help you ask the right questions. It reminds us where the answers really are. Instead of jumping to applications like 95% of the people do, we should worry, worry about what are our guiding principles and what are our guiding doctrines. Helps us lift our perspective and vision. Help us take a long-term perspective rather than a checklist approach in life. Because too many times people think, oh, pay my tithing check, pay my fast offering check. And really the purpose of all of this is, is not a checklist approach, but to help us to become like our Savior. Reminds us of the importance of Christ in our daily contact. And I love, it changes our thinking, it changes our mundane act of obedience into holy acts of consecration. And if we can do that, we will do so much better and we will accomplish so much more. And we shared a lot of ideas and experiences. Um, you guys remember what my three-word summary was for this class? What was my three-word summary for the class? You follow this three-word summary into everything that I want you to do in this class. Okay, Tyler. I know this is it, uh, becoming like Jesus. Uh, close. Close. It was this one. Life is good. <laughs> if you follow this, you will, you will accomplish all that's in you. Again, just simple things. You know, in fact, uh, when we travel, I, I always say life is good, life is good. In fact, the students kind of tease me about it because I, I say it so much. And I'm trying to back off, you know, a little bit. But again, these are the things that we want you to do. Love the Lord and put and pay him first. Invest wisely. Find happiness in your spouse and family. Enjoy the journey. Invest in yourself and family for education and missions. Save 20%, 15% for retirement. Get and stay out of debt. Know your vision goals. Operate on a budget. Do a good deed to invent better. Again, so everything in this class is summed up in these three words. Let me, um, let me just sh share this song. It came out last year, I think. I really like it. Yeah, I put the words off to the left there so you can see it.
else as you, as you heard this song. Dan, what were you thinking about as this music was playing? Um, I'm just thinking there's a lot of good in the world. Other thoughts? I know one of the things that I got, I like is really everyone plays it and there are melodies in each one of us. It's always glorious. My wife and I, uh, talent skips generations, so our kids got the talent, but we still sing in the choir. Um, my wife's a lot better than I am, but, but I, I realize how important the different parts in the choir are. And the choir would not be the same without, without each one. Um, other, other thoughts that come to you? Michael. The path that we're on is orchestrated by a higher power. The path that we're on is orchestrated by a higher power. And the more that we allow him to orchestrate it, the better off we'll be. And truly, it's so amazing what we're all creating. You realize it's amazing what you're creating and what you're doing. So I, I, I like this. Uh, I like this song because it just emphasizes that fact. Um, the first day of class, <coughs> I shared this quote. Jessica, could you read that for us, please? Yes, Google says, we told you to help our young men and young women through their lives even sooner than they do now, but they need to make certain serious decisions only once. We can put some things away from us once and have them with them. We can make a single decision about certain So my question is, what are the things you've decided to do because of the things that we've shared in this class? Save 20%. Why is that important? Uh, Why? Well, because you're paying yourself first. You're making it a priority. Yeah. And then what's going to set you up for retirement? And then when you get to be an old geezer like me, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Chen Chen, what have you decided to do? Save 5% of my mom's Okay. Save 20%. 15% for retirement and then 5% for your other area. I have decided, what else have you decided to do? Nathan. And why? You don't have to pay that 200 extra a month on your private mortgage insurance. Yeah. Ben. Okay. And why? Um, to avoid catastrophes that yeah. might arise. You know, security for you yourself and your family. Yeah. What we talked about: death is not an excuse for not taking care of your family. You don't just don't have to. You don't. It doesn't have to be the expensive stuff. Cheap convertible term is great. George. Uh, base my ratios off of gross income or pre-tax income. And why? Uh, makes me dislike taxes even more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that we teach. Um, I still haven't sent my email back to the uh, Department of the Treasury. The, this article on financial literacy, the one thing that we don't teach, we don't teach how much people have to earn to pay back. And I think that's a mistake. And I think it's probably because it shows the way you help people get out of debt as you reduce taxes. <laughs> but that is something that needs. How much do you have to earn to be able to spend one dollar? To spend or pay back. I have decided to, what else? Daniel. Uh, I would consider that like a priority. Oh, avoid. <laughs>
that the Joneses are in debt and, and really sad too. Can we buy, borrow money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people who don't care? And if we really knew how little people thought of us, we wouldn't worry what they thought of us. Other, other decisions? All you Ethan. have uh, six months of emergency. Okay. And why? Um, okay, so emergency, you lose a job or not a work. And I also think it helps you make hard decisions sometimes. Yeah. We talked about like when you know, I take a class, it's like the, if you have an emergency fund, then you can maybe afford to leave a job for a little bit. It's kind of bad for me too. So. My, my brother is working in Texas. Graduated here, took a job on a, a construction job down there in Texas. Uh, the first time the job had ever come in under budget and on time. They had never done it before. And his boss came to him and said, uh, okay, I want you to t tell the, I, I want one of these sliding glass doors. Tell the, the supplier they shorted you one. He says, no, I won't do it. He says, you'll do it or you'll lose your job. And what did he do? He says, I won't do it. And even though, again, the first time the company had been under budget and on time, he still lost his job. Of course, he got a much better job <laughs> when he came back here too. But yeah, having that emergency fund is really critical. And it also converts emergencies into inconveniences because it's just painful. Isaac. Um, always make sure uh, your credit report is accurate. Try to keep it up on it every, every year or every yeah. quarter. And why? your insurance, lots of other areas there too. So that is significant. What's this side over here? What have you decided? Um, right. To give a certain percentage of my income to, to, to get it charity. And why? Um, so I mean, it's because it's, I think it connects with some sort of, we are stewards. I mean, yeah. the money is not always given to us by God. Or yeah. Yeah. yeah, they need to help us too. And I really agree, you know, little things. Even giving blood, I walk out of there and I feel, you know what, I've done a pretty good job. And even when you just give little things. Um, but realize serving in the temple is giving. Serving in your calling is giving. Being a good parent is giving. All of these things. And hopefully you feel good for the work, for the things that you do. Let's take a couple more, one more. Yeah. I pass my mortgage by 40 if I can. Okay. And why? I did the math on how much I'm actually paying in interest over the life of the loan, and I don't really care. I'm not going to pay that much. And you're not going to pay that much. You know, we get to choose. I like these. I, I like the decisions that you've made. And, and hopefully we've been able to support these. I'm sure there's lots of other ones you could do. Um, Let me, uh, let me just tell a couple stories. Um, anyone done a marathon here? Okay, uh, we had a, busy, a home teacher that told us he should, ran his first marathon at 55. So my wife and I decided to do it and we did it. And the marathons are fun. Um, we did three of them, we did two of them one year. We decided that's pretty painful, <laughs> but it was still fun. Our goal was just to finish before the police closed it down at six hours. Has anyone done a 50-20? A 50-20 is a 50-mile walk in 20 hours. Um, we were concerned that our young men were just, they'd start something and then they would quit. We were concerned that they, that they were not learning to, that some things you just have to stick out. And so I uh, worked with Jose de Hoyas, who had done this before in previous wars. What a 50-20 is, is you get up at 3.30, you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. At 3.30, you're at the church. And here what we did is we, at 3.30, we drove to Benjamin, which is down by Patience. And at 4 a.m., you put on your reflective vest and you start walking. You walk east for a couple of miles and you walk south around West Mountain. And then at 10 miles, what they do is they bring out the scout trailer and you've got the... the the oatmeal and the, you know, 
egg McMuffin and whatever people, and some people would just grab it as they were walking and eat it along the way, some would stop. And then you just keep walking around there, so you're on the side of Utah Lake. And you get into all these little tiny towns that have 300 and 400 people there. And at mile 25, what they do is they bring out the scout stuff and it's hot dogs and hamburgers and soda, anything else you can drink. And again, some people, what they'll do is they'll grab it and just eat it while they walk and other people will sit and talk. And then what happens is you start hitting the wall. Anyone who's done a marathon, you, your wall is about 22 miles. Uh, around 50-20, uh, the wall's at, at 40 miles. And it's pretty good. So right now it's getting to be about 5 o'clock at night. <coughs> And so what do we do is we bring in the angels, which are the parents of these young men. And the parents walk with them the last 10 miles. And so they walk, into, we come into Springville where the uh, Burger King used to be, then we go south on Industrial Parkway. We, we make a detour around the Stouffer's there, just so we keep the, the youth off of that. And then we come and we turn on Nine Feast and we end it at the Tempe High School. And it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, so, First time we did it, we started with, uh, I think, 13 kids and about seven made it. Uh, later on, we did it with more, and so we did it, uh, about, we did it about 78. Uh, and what did I learn from the 50-20? That 50-20, you just have to start walking. The first time I did it, I, we were not prepared. We didn't know what we were getting into. We had no clue. Remember having <laughs> blisters about that big? on my feet, and I remember just praying, as Heavenly Father, help me to figure out what's going on. I can't do this. And I, you know, if, if the leaders start giving up, then what, what are the youth gonna do? And I just got the impression just to walk on the side, walk on the gravel, and I could do that. Uh, about the third time, my wife said, I wanna do it with you. And so she did it with us, too, and it is painful. Um, she says, you know, it wasn't bad after my feet start hurting, so she had the same problems with blisters and things like that, and she just walked through it. But she said, she says, I'm never doing that again, and she's been true to her word. She only did it that one time. Um, I have, first time we, we started, like I said, it was young men. Second year we had like 19 or 20. Third year the young women decided to come along with us, and so we had to make some adjustments. Uh, you also have some additional angels there, and these are the people that drive by in their cars. And so on the 50-20, what you don't want to do is you don't want to be carrying much. So you're in your tennis shoes, uh, and what they'll do is they'll come by and give you a couple of water bottles and then toss the old ones in the back seat. Then the really cool angels are the ones who brought popsicles and things like this, because this was in, you know, June, July time period, so it was really warm. Um, but it was neat. Remember the first year we did it, there was, I, I was with five other young men. I, I was the adult and there was five men, young men. And some of them started feeling, hey, we can't do this. We can't do this. And we made a commitment that, you know what, we'll all do it together or we won't do it at all. And then the key was, if we could get them to the 40, 40 mile mark, then the parents would come and they would help us out. Um, the youngest of my kids to do it uh, was nine. And then at mile 40, she said, dad, I can't do it anymore. I <laughs> You know, as Hank said yesterday, he says, what do you do? You start with reasoning, and then you do bribery, and then threats of violence, and then violence, you know, so we've got that. And if reasoning didn't work, it says, okay, what, what do you want? You want a bicycle? <laughs> what can we do to, to, to bribe you? She says, Dad, it's just, it just, just not fun anymore. This is, it, this is hard. This is really tough. Um, and so we finally said, uh, says, I'll tell you what, Emily, we will carry you if you will at least try. And we carried her probably more than a mile. But she made it. And then she was one of the youngest ones that was right there. But the point here is a lot of people think a marathon is a tough thing. They think is life is like a marathon. And truthfully, I don't think so. I think life is more like a 50-20. It's just long. It's painful. It's, it, it's tough. You come across, a, you know, you're, you're in those little places over there on Utah Lake, and there's a lot of roadkill. And there are animals and there are snakes. <laughs> it's, just, it's just really interesting. Um, but the key is the one, those who make it together work together. And, and they're trying to, trying to get help. How does that relate to personal finance? And that is, I think we need to, just to keep walking. Let me just share some experiences with uh, myself. I, 
Um, did an undergraduate Mandarin Chinese and then did an MBA. The only reason I got my internship and my MBA is because of nepotism. My cousin said, Brian's having a problem getting his internship. He turned to his boss and said, hey, any chance we could help him? And he goes, yeah, sure, send him over. He can't screw things up too badly. <laughs> so the only thing, because all I'd ever done was swung a hammer. All I'd ever done was just you know, be a carpenter. Um, sent out 34 letters of er, resumes. I got 32 rejection notices back, and two of them just didn't respond. Um, I was two hours from getting on a plane to go to the Dallas-Fort Worth area when the, the company that I'd done the internship with came back and said they made me an offer. And considering it was my only offer, I was very glad for it. I took it. Um, met someone, I got engaged. She had only been a member for four months, and so we agreed that we'll wait eight months. Um, I was excited, life was good. Uh, however, the more we started talking, my patriarchal blessing says, you know what, you need to get a doctor. And so as I talked with her about that, she says, no, we can't get a doctor. We've got, we've got, we've got to settle down. We get married, we've got to settle down. We've got to start work. And I realized that wasn't going to work. So at the end of December, we broke off the engagement. Not a fun time. Any of you know that, you know, starting a new job, you're engaged, you're really excited about life, and, and things like that happen. Well, let's go four weeks ahead. This time, um, bottom fell out of the shipping market. I was in a company uh, called Utah International, subsidiary of GE. And what happened when the bottom fell out, you know, they had to let people go. And I was one of the last ones hired, so I was the first one to let go. My boss <laughs> came to me and he said, Brian, it's one thing to let someone go when they're doing poorly. He says, but it's another thing when they're doing a good job. He said these immortal words, I'm gonna go get myself good and drunk. Now I didn't appreciate that, but I knew what his I impact was. He says, you know what, I respect you. And we're still friends, which is neat. So fast forward two weeks after that, the girl I was engaged to married the missionary that baptized her. Six weeks after we broke off the engagement. Keep walking. So I lost my job. Keep walking. I only applied to two different schools for a PhD. George Washington and, and UC Berkeley. Can you imagine me at UC Berkeley? <laughs> but I, um, a month later I got notice there. UC Berkeley said, hey, we're not interested in our program. Keep walking. I was trying to do everything I should. I was in the elder quorum presidency <laughs> at Berkeley. So I was trying to fulfill those callings. I was going to the temple every week. This time a book came out called, well, what color is your parachute? I was trying to do everything I possibly could. And still, everything. So no, no work. So now we're on one, two, three months. And a month later I got the notice from George Washington University that they weren't interested in me in their program either. I actually flew out to there and talked to them a little bit. And they only allow, they had like, five applications and they accepted two and one of those already had a PhD. So it, it keep walking. And you know, and, and what do you do when things are tough? What do you do when every time you turn around, you guys have heard my stories of going into for unemployment, things like that. But the key is you just have to keep walking. You have to keep moving ahead. You have to keep remembering your conduct. And I was still doing all that I should, tending the temple serving in my calling, doing everything that I felt I should. So finally, after about six months, got an, I got had an interview and I got a job with a company called uh, Amdahl Corporation out of in, in San Jose, in Sunnyvale. First family meeting, I sat next to someone <laughs> who was engaged to the, someone in the elder corporation, but, but later she became my wife. And then six months later, we were on our way back to Washington, D.C. Finish the PhD, the Dura PhD. So my my point here is, we just need to keep walking. We need to realize that the, the Lord has this customized plan for us. It's not going to be easy. The Lord never said it would, it would be easy. I had a picture when I was in college here, a picture of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it said, "I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it." And you've got to realize that that's the way it is. It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Why could Christ go through so much? Because he knew the joy that would come to us was a joy that would come to him. If we can think on the things, the scriptures say, let the solemnities of eternity rest on your mind. 
who can think on the joy of the resurrection, of, of sealed families, covenant families, it will make so much better decisions. And it will be so much easier to do. Let me... How do you want to be remembered? So one of the important things is to think, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, my dad was getting old. And uh, we didn't know it then, but I mean, he was going down here pretty quick. Um, and all of a sudden, I got this idea. He says, you need to write a poem for your dad. And I thought, that's strange. But the impression can't and, and I'm not someone who writes poems. Uh, you know, I, I did when my, when my grandfather passed away and I was on my mission. I wrote a poem because that's, I, it was just, he was my namesake. I spent a ton of time with him. And it was really hard for me, and so I wrote this poem anyway. And so the other times we've written poems is when, uh, you know, we had a stillborn in the family, things like that. But I just had felt this impression. And then uh, my dad passed away on Thursday and Friday night. And so we were just sitting in bed. It was about 10 o'clock at night. And I just told my wife, I said, you know, I wrote this poem for dad. She goes, sing it to me. <laughs> it just kind of shocked me. You know how sometimes you're really nervous, something that you don't normally do? Well, uh, I don't know if any of you know the song, The Leader of the Band by Dan Fogelberg. Uh, So, but this is how I, how I remember my dad. And uh, I thought it was just interesting. What are the things that I remember from my dad and what are the things that we want to be remembered by? A quiet child, the fifth of eight, a carpenter's third son. How to make work fun. Um, Honest man who later became a soldier. Me, and many of your parents were the same way. Served in World War II. Um, uh, he was actually a uh, taught uh, student pilots how to fly. He was in charge of one of the Thunderbird deals in Arizona. In fact, he was once in a flight with a student pilot, and a plane came up underneath. It, it crashed. And the people in the other plane were killed, and he was able to bring the plane down, land the plane. And the amazing thing is the people, I've, I've seen pictures of that plane, and people say, there's no way you should have been able to fly that plane. So I believe my dad, uh, the, the spirit works on small things that helps us. Taught his children discipline. <coughs> well, of course, the leader of our family's tired, and his eyes are growing old. But his blood runs through our family, and his heart is in my soul. This man has tried his whole life through to serve his God above. We're just a living legacy to the power of his love. Notice that the H is capitalized there. It's not my dad's love that's for the legacy. It's the power of his love. It's the power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Taught his children discipline the things that we should do. Shared with us his love of God and how we should be true. Took his trial standing up. My mom passed away at age 53. I have an older brother who was wounded in Vietnam we used to see those yellow taxi cabs coming because they'd bring the telexes, and we used to hate to see them come. They came once on our street and, um, when Kenny Pedersen died. And then when they came for us, it, they, they said, you know, we don't know if he's going to live or die. But they would think, uh, uh, he took his trial standing up. Ever giving, and he shared with us his favorite friend. What do I remember? The example, the stories that he shared, the time. Remember, my dad was, he was the bishop. Um, he was also <laughs> uh, in our little town of Brentwood. Uh, the person who got the most votes was, was the mayor, but he got the most votes, but he didn't want to be the mayor. So, so he was just on the city council. Remember, you know, the time that he spent, my mom would get the trailer ready and we'd go pick up my dad at the office at 
about five o'clock on Friday, and then we go up to Camden. But the times. Thank you for your kindness in the times when you got tough. And Grandpa, we don't think we fed you enough. You know, enough. So when we sang this, as usual, we, we, my wife and I don't have the voices, so we had to sing. the kids sing the the, uh, the verses, and we sing the chorus. But realize, so how do you want to be remembered? And once you do that, you will make much better decisions as to how you will act in this life and the things that you want to do. So getting close to the end, what are the things that wise stewards know? I can take everything that I've learned and the things that we've taught in this class, what are the, the 10 things that wise stewards know? Number one, know who they are and why. They understand that they're children of God. And you know what, if they can do four things, as long as what you're doing is consistent with one of these four things here, you're doing the right way. Number two, wise stewards know they recognize their stewardship. We're all stewards. So what do wise stewards know? They know nothing is their own. And so they use that stewardship wisely. Number three, they create. They understand that creation is a spiritual gift. And so what do they do? They can do all things with this help. We set goals, develop plans, determine constraints to accomplish any vision. And we can accomplish anything. So why are students create themselves with confidence each day through our prayers, our goals, our budgets, and our lives? Have their priors in order. It's not, it's not he who stands tallest when he stands on his wallets. It's not she who dies with the most clothes wins. It really is. You know, what are the true riches? You know, behold, he who has eternal life is rich. You know, are we really moving in that direction? Plan their future early and live their plans. Again, it makes me feel good when I, when Sister Bingham says, you know, make a plan for your life. And then prioritize your plan. So what we've tried to do in this class is really help you to do that. So I think you guys, you guys will follow this plan. It will be a good guide to help you to take you where you want to be. Why stewards seek God's help in all aspects of their lives, in each of these areas. Six, money can't buy joy or happiness, but money can do a lot of things. It can share, it can buy security. So what you do is you use money for what it's good for, is to buy security for you and your family. And then where do you find joy? As we've heard from the conference, Joy and happiness doesn't come from your circumstances. It comes from your focus. So we find joy in our Savior or joy in our families and service to others. And six, understand assets and liabilities. Assets are easy, but there are two types of assets, income-consuming and income-generating assets. doesn't mean that you can't have income-consuming assets. I had two grandkids on the razor, and we were up in the mountains, and we stopped and we went hiking, and it was just really fun. But it just means that you just don't have all income-consuming assets. Liabilities are things you borrow for. So what do we do? We maximize income-consuming assets. We have fun with our er, income-generating assets. We have fun with our income-consuming assets with our families. And then we eliminate liabilities. And that way we can enjoy them. Understand income. Again, different types of income. Earned income is income from your job. Passive income, mainly from your business. Portfolio income from your portfolio. Ideally, what we want wise stewards know, and what I hope for each of you is by the time you retire, your portfolio and your passive income is enough, and it's making you more. So while you're serving missions and while you're helping others, you're still making significant income. Wise stewards know they're responsible. Robert, can I get you to read that for me, please? Foolishly, you choose to be 
into online realtors and just learn how to apply. Invest it in your mind and learn how to apply after so that they treat you well as a soul and not a person. The choice is yours and no one's yours. Every day with every dollar, you decide to be rich, poor, or middle class. So what do wives do what you do? Patience to be responsible. And then the last one. Wives do it to remember. You know, we all have to, or said we always remember him. But what do we remember? You know, it's just not the things we must know, but it's the thing we must do. When I was a kid, I am a child of God, said, teach me all that I must know. And later on, they went and changed it. Teach me all that I must do. Because that's what is, what's important. Number one, scriptures make us wise if we learn from them and obey the commandments. It's not enough to have scriptures. What do they say? He who won't read and he who can't read are in the same boat. We need to be studying and pondering and praying. What's, what's wisdom? <laughs> Keeping the commandments. I used to think my dad was one of the smartest people around. And now as I get older, I realize it was just because he did, did what he was supposed to do. He was honest, he had integrity. He kept the commandments. Savior makes us holy if we repent and take advantage of it. Not enough to have a Savior. We have to take advantage of it. Remind me of Heller's, uh, Helen Keller's comments. She goes, it's sad for the people who see and yet have no vision. You know, make sure that we, we have the vision. Third, storms make us strong if we learn the lessons God's wanting us to learn. We're all in storms. My guess is this class has been a storm for some of you. Um, but I like what it says. The greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain. And hopefully this class is <laughs> for your gain. I love this one too. Give unto men weakness that they may be humble. Do you ever think that the Lord gives us weaknesses? That the weaknesses we have are not because we're bad people or we're strange or things like that. But he gives us so we'll be humble. And then we'll seek his help to overcome the weaknesses. And then with his help, we'll make weak things become strong. Brother Jared knew about storms. So he was told he's got to go to the promised land and he was given instructions on how to build a ship. He built the ship and what were the three problems that he had? No air, no light, and what was the third one? Yeah, no, no steering. So when it came to the question of air, what did the Lord say? Yeah, so it drill a hole in the top and drill a hole in the bottom and my guess the, the hole was at a diagonal and so capillary action would cause the water to go away in the end. So likewise the Lord when we have problems he'll help us to know that. What did the Lord do with the light? He said figure it out for yourself. A lot of times the problems that's the problem and so what the brother of Jude, Jared do? Molten the stones and the Lord touched them. Likewise, the Lord will touch our stones as well. And then what did the Lord say about navigation? I will take care of it. And what did he do? He sent the storm. Did you ever think that the storms that we're going through now are part of the Lord's plan to take us to where he needs us to be? Um, the Lord's in our storms. Um, in 2007 to 2009, a number of friends, they had their finances in order and their houses in an order. In 2007, 2009, it was not a storm. It was just kind of a hiccup. They continued. I know other, other people that were in debt up to their eyebrows and they lost homes and they lost cars and things like that. Um, prior to 9-11, um, there was an apostle said, he said, there's a portent of stormy weather ahead. We need to get heed, and he was telling people to get out of debt. I remember going over to a family back then that I home taught, and the father says, you know what, I'm feeling really strongly that I need, you know, from this council, we need to get out of debt. So they sold their home, they downsized. It was not an easy time. But two years later, when 9-11 hit, he did international consulting, and his business dropped by 70% that year and 40% the next year. And if he wouldn't have done that, things would be a significantly different. 
so the key is what are we learning from the lessons that we have? Can we learn the lessons that Heavenly Father would have? Because if we don't, the Lord's going to have to send, send more severe lessons, more severe storms to teach us the things we need. And again, the question, Heavenly Father, what am I supposed to learn from this is probably one of the most important questions we can ask. And the important, other important thing is as we'll be listening. And the fourth one is we can be of good cheer if we will heed the prophet's counsel. Nathan, can you read that, please? I love that from Sister Bing. And ask in faith as you step forward. And the future is as bright as your faith. The first day of class, we talked about this, about how to change. We talked about uh, the Packer's comment. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than the study of behavior will be. I encourage you to not let schooling get in the way of your education. Make sure you're continuing to study. As you continue in your personal finance and other areas, make sure you understand the guiding principles, guiding doctrines, because the answers are there. Um, the last day of class, I had two more final recommendations. This is the best way to make a permanent change for good, is to make Christ our model. We don't compare ourselves to each other. We don't compare ourselves to others. We compare ourselves to Christ. And realize that the whole goal of life is, do we become like Jesus? And the judgment day is, is really going to be, do you feel comfortable in his presence? And so as we change and as we give and as we do these things, we will be coming more like our Savior Jesus Christ. And then finally, we want to remember Nephi's counsel. Connor, can you read that for me, please? And now, my sons and daughters, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that you must build your foundation. When the devil shall send forth his mighty wind, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, yea, with all his hail and his mighty storm shall beat upon you, he shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe, because of the rock upon which you are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation which whereon if men build, they cannot fall. Mm -hmm. Love the fact that we have a sure foundation. Did you ever have one of your favorite scriptures? I'd like to close with my favorite scripture. And it actually says this. It says, for verily I say unto you that great things await you. You know, as you follow through on your plans, if you do the things that you've written down, great things do await you. Um, I said as I started this class, I had three goals for the class. Number one, uh, I wanted you to feel the spirit. So hopefully as we've come through, hopefully you felt the spirit in the class. You tried to bring it. And it's amazing that when the spirit comes, there are two teachers, and one of them is an amazing teacher, and it's not me. Number two, I've tried to help you know that I care. I've learned everyone's names. When you come in, I try to find out what's your major and where you're from, and a little bit about your families. And I appreciate the, the, the neat things that I get to know. The good news is when you get ready, if you need uh, letters of recommendation or things like that, it's make, it makes it so much easier for me because I know who you are, and I've tried. Uh, I still make, still make mistakes now and then. I still get... Connor and <laughs> Hugh mixed up, but, but I, we've tried. So I hope you know that I care. And number three, I've tried to teach you things that will save you a million bucks over your lifetime. And that means in each of these 16 years, I've tried to come up with concrete, 16 areas, discrete, different ideas to help you to, to save that. Now, uh, kind of in conclusion, I just wanted to say thanks for allowing me to come. This is really fun. You know, uh, retiring next year is going to be hard because I'm giving up something that's really important, but I'm, I'm gaining something that's even more important, which is, which is serving the Lord on a mission. So we're excited for that. But I just want you to know that the gospel is true, that, that he has all the answers. And then as we strive, he knows us by name and knows us better than we know ourselves. And as we strive to become more like him, we will get closer to our spouses, we'll get closer to our kids and closer to our Savior. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.